everything we know, from people and ants, to stars and galaxies, to quarks and atoms, the entire universe, might just be a simulation running inside a supercomputer, inside an even bigger universe. Ancient philosophers said that the universe is a dream that we're waiting to wake up from. In this dream world of the imagination, anything is possible. All cultural items, from the dreams of our rodent-like ancestors, to books, to television shows, are merely permutations of the reality we think we live in. Today's age of computers and video games places simulations at the center of our cultural consciousness. A select group of us perform simulations for fun and profit, and we call them games, role-playing and otherwise. We live to run simulations. Join us on the Simulationist podcast as we explore our culture of simulations. Hello once again. Welcome to the Simulationist podcast. Today is the 17th of November on which we are recording. This is iteration... 63, oh, 2013, iteration 63. My name is Josh Levin, and across from me, as always... Ryan Kirkby. Hey, Ryan. Hello. Okay. Hello. <laughs> so, uh, how's your week been this week, Josh? My week, well, it's, uh, I don't know where it went. Uh, it's only been a week since we recorded last. Um, I've played lots of Minecraft, well, actually not as much as I'd like, but... Enough to be, you know, to say I had fun. Well, if we had enough time to play all the games we wanted to, we'd have 50-hour days. Uh, yeah, true. Uh, how it goes, man. When, when we're, we're, we're in a society that's just so full of fiction, I could play all sorts of things and, and experiment with the new stuff. And, oh, hey, look, they got a free demo to play here. You can just go crazy on that stuff. Who needs sleep, anyways? <laughs> exactly. Well, you yeah. know. But yes, uh, anything exciting going on? Have you found any uh, ways to break the game? Oh, um, well, I haven't, but I did see a YouTube video. I guess it isn't me, but anyways, I saw it. I saw a YouTube video where somebody had, uh, in the newest update where they have bigger trees, um, you plant four saplings in a square, like a two-by-two two square. Like what you're doing with, uh, or historically with the, uh, the jungle trees. Uh, yeah, that's right. And so it's similar to that, except these trees are shorter and they're the trees that you find in the roofed forest. Ah. So they're shorter than the, the giant jungle trees, but they're taller than your standard forest trees, so they're in the middle. I guess they're medium so, trees. So you need to get yourself something to help stand up to, to properly cut them down, but not take an entire yeah. day like what you're doing with the, uh, the jungle. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Bring a sandwich if you're cutting down a jungle tree. Uh, yeah, yeah, because they don't drop apples for some reason, but... Um, they do Which is odd, because the oak trees drop apples like crazy sometimes. Uh, yeah. Uh, so with these new trees, what you can do is you can plant them... Um, if you can get on top of the, the roof of the nether, which is like made of bedrock... Ah, yes, I remember seeing an outside pr- uh, perspective of that. Yeah, so you can you can sneak away, like either like throw an ender pearl and, and squish through the bedrock. You're not supposed to be able to, but if no. you, you can get on top of that. That's a long-standing exploit in the game that people have known about for a long time, and it's probably not going to get fixed, but, I mean, who knows? It doesn't cause a lot of problems, though, does it? I mean, oh, no, now you're outside. What are you going to do now, right? Uh, well, I mean, people use it for various things. They can make farms up there because um, if you, you know, the 128-block radius where monsters can spawn? Yeah. So if you, cli- if you build a, if you pillar up, like, from the roof of the nether, which you can do, um, then none of the nether below you will be loaded, so all of the monsters will have to be in the little area underneath you. So uh-huh. you get more monsters that way. Then you can do gold farming and whatever. Provided you want to fight all that sort of stuff. I mean, some people don't play the game to get into a fight. So uh, Yeah, true. Well, if you bring a bow with you, that makes it easier. Oh, um, yes. Or you can like create you know an elaborate machine with pistons that push them off and drop them. I must admit, as a player of Dwarf Fortress, it sounds very dwarfy to do it that way. Uh, yeah, of course. Um, so, anyway, so if if you manage to get on top of the Nether and you plant one of these four by four tree or two by two trees, sorry, um, they have like little blocks that offshoot, sort of that look kind of like roots or you know extra branches. Oh, so they will actually grow into the ground, and um, they haven't been coded to not replace bedrock. So they will replace bedrock with these roots, and then all you have to do is just chop out the roots, and you have a hole through the bedrock. And uh, so that's 
uh, video. I, then so you don't I, need to use that exploit anymore. You've come up with another exploit to, to work it through. Right? Yeah, and then from then on, you can just go, you know, build a ladder through that hole and just do whatever you want. Haul things up there. So the roots go through all types of bedrock. Could you make it down through the bottom of the regular world this way? Yes. Yes. So you could literally now make a, a, a truly bottomless pit. Uh, yep, yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, PvP zones beware. And uh, you probably know this already, but if you fall into that, it like you die. Basically. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, I hope you die. Otherwise, it's a long time before you know you, you starve to death and, and respawn somewhere. Well, it's like Minecraft deletes itself. <laughs> so it's it's a mercy killing in that case. Uh, so yeah, I've been watching YouTube. Well, I mean, a big part of what I do is just watch other people do play and have fun, and and so you know, I watch all these. Well, with a game that big and that many mods, it really does behoove you to to spend the time watching what other people are doing, how they're doing it, and you can learn a lot. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, and I found it. My my brother, who's a lot younger than me. Um, he has just started watching like redstone tutorial videos, ah. and he built like a cannon. <laughs> and I thought that was so cool. Like, like I've never built a cannon. I mean, it you've was seen it being mode. done, though, right? Oh uh, yeah, I've seen the the YouTube videos of cannons being made in Minecraft. Ah, very nice. Uh, and he made it in creative. So I usually don't play creative, but. I like to test some stuff out in creative. Like, how yes. does this look? Does this work right? Does this look like a real window? Or does it just look like a bunch of weird staircase sitting around? Uh, but yeah, I was so, like, happy that my brother was, like... Because, I mean, he plays Minecraft and he just, you know, makes derpy little... I mean, not <laughs> he's really good, actually. He Like, he, he makes cool... Like, he likes to do airplanes and, um, like, army stuff. Ah, yeah, intriguing. And army scenes and stuff. So when he, I don't know how he got to the YouTube video, I mean, it's fairly easy if you do a YouTube search for Minecraft canon, yeah. you can find something cool. So he did, and he copied it, and so, yeah. Very nice, very nice. Um, and, and me, I just uh, played around in the uh, the end. My, I think I told you last time I was kind of trying to beautify the, the, the nether. Yeah. So I moved on to the end, and I planted some grass there, and tried to make it look a little bit nicer. Very nice. Um, yeah. The fact that you're trying. <laughs> that's, that's what really matters. Whether or not it looks better with the grass or not, well, it's an aesthetic call. Uh, yeah, it, it, it's funny because my style of building, I look at it one way, like, I don't know, squint or a little bit, and it looks kind of cool, but I look at it another way, it's like, oh, that looks horrible. Um, but I kind of enjoyed having things that could be seen either way that are a little bit Well, off. that's true art. It's <laughs> yeah. very subjective then. I hope so, yeah. <laughs> At least that's your story and you're sticking to yeah, it. Yeah, I'm sticking to that. I'll take that. Yeah. There. Alrighty. Um, I think that basically covers what I've been doing. I have, oh. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, let's move on to you. All right. Well, I've got two things uh, this week. Uh, one's a movie. We'll talk about that in a little bit. Uh, I've been working on the problems with uh, my mod on Dwarf Fortress. Oh, yeah. I managed to fix a few of them. Um, I think I have a bead as to why a few others aren't working properly. Okay, good. So you're making progress. I am making good progress, idea. and there's some people that are helping me out, showing me what they've done with their stuff. So I think I might be able to, with a very little amount of work, take uh, one test subject, um, likely the, the mad scientists themselves, uh, one bar of metal, and uh, put a line of metal over top of the dwarf's skin. Oh, wow. Hey, yeah. That sounds cool. Is that I, like a James Bond movie or something? Uh, if only if you use gold. <laughs> oh, okay. I mean, you can use copper, you can, well, you so can you're, use you're putting that as metal. an option then? Of course. Right now, <laughs> uh, I'm not even trying to balance it for like, okay... Let's make this for resources and all that, and you know, and uh, to make something this good, you have to use up this much, you know, energy resources. No, right now I'm just making sure all the reactions work, and then I'll figure out balance later. So you you are gonna have dwarves with like metal skin? Yes, I will. I like that. Yeah. And it, well, it'll be I also think it's the other thing I'm working on is I've been noticing what sort of tags you can add, and so I think if you put some animals close by, I can make a stone. That automatically sublimates to a gas, and then anyone yeah. who, who gets uh, affected by the gas, it'll add 
the intelligent and can speak tags and all that. Oh, nice. So I might be able to make all pets within a certain area uplifted to dwarf level intelligence. Wow. Weird. <laughs> Which I think will be fun. Well, in the game, uh, there is a species called Tiger Man. Mm -hmm. um, they're like humans with the head of a tiger. Okay. Um, right now, elves bring them. They are intelligent, but they also have the pet tag. I see. And so they can be bought and sold as pets. Um, you have to keep raw meat out because that's what they eat, and they, they can't use a well. Apparently they've got paw hands or something. Yeah. Okay. Um, so you have to have a proper open water source for them to drink from, but they will exist in your fortress, um, gather social skills as they chat with the dwarves, and if they're good enough at their social skills, may wind up becoming the mayor <laughs> of your dwarven settlement. And so I'm thinking, everyone likes the, these tiger men, but they only really happen in, like, savage biomes of certain types. And you know what? Trying to get a breeding pair of them is rather difficult. Wouldn't it just be a lot easier to make dogs intelligent so that they can speak? Then you can imagine when they come running after and attacking goblins that they're swearing at the goblins or something. Or they're saying, hey, 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 I found an <laughs> intruder, I found an intruder. And that's how you determine, like, oh, there was a goblin skulking around. The dogs let me know, because they screamed it at me. Huh. Um, yeah. There may be some problems uh, down the road as to whether or not you can butcher them and eat them if they're intelligent. Mm. Uh, there is some stuff prohibiting the eating of intelligent flesh unless you modify the dwarven civilization before ever generating the world. I see. Yeah. Um, but I don't believe the tag will carry on into the next, uh, you know, uh, generation of, of whatever you uplift to intelligence. I see. So. Their dog puppies, you know, children will be standard puppies. They won't be intelligent talking puppies. Oh, okay. Yeah, sure. So I think it's not that bad of one. So I'm going to have some fun with that. But the other one I really want to test is I noticed you can change the gender of, of, of a creature through adding and changing tags. Uh -huh. uh, in this okay. case, a dwarf and gender, or well, any gender, is determined by a caste. And so you can change the case. I think that was supposed to be reserved for things like uh, if you're making bee people and you want yeah. to raise someone up to becoming a queen bee, they would have to undergo the transformation, change their case, and then all of a sudden, hey, queen. Okay, yeah. So I want to try this with a <laughs> married dwarf just to see if the game still keeps them married even if uh, both husband and wife become wife and wife or husband and husband. Ah, okay. So I'm, I'm going to have a little fun testing that yeah, yeah. out, seeing if, uh, if it's already coded into the game. Like, was this thought of beforehand? Mm -hmm. Because uh, I've been looking at some of the stuff they've done. Uh, wagons are currently a creature in the game. Um, it's, it hasn't been settled out into moving items, so to get it, uh, like, uh, what would otherwise be considered, I guess, like a workshop to move, it has to actually yeah. be an animal. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, yeah, in the, the creature files, you can find wagon. Hey, look at that. Uh, so, with enough coding and doing it right, you can turn into a were wagon. You can, uh, you know, do things, <laughs> and, and, you know, like you can animate wagons. You know, you have zombie wagons. Uh, the problem yeah. is, if they move, uh, due to the hard coding in the game, they will automatically be scuttled. Oh. Yeah, uh, they have to be pulled, and that's the only way they'll survive. Okay. Uh, people are working around that, maybe coming up with a tread animal for like a, like a tank tread, and so as it has its own moving, you know, pulled part. Okay. Yeah. They're working on it. it hasn't been figured out properly yet. Yeah. But uh, people are working with, with stuff like that, so you can manipulate a lot of variety of tags. Like all of a sudden, I turn you from a dwarf into a wagon. Boom. <laughs> so there's some very very fun cased and and and, and role changing stuff I really want to experience. But uh, for the bit with the wagons, is that uh, uh, it has, like, you, you can turn yourself into a wear wagon in the er in testing arena, and then when you move, it's being scuttled. You get scuttled, and it has the line, you have been scuttled. It, and that exists, because apparently the designer thought, what happens if for some reason the player becomes a wagon and then tries to move? They have to get scuttled. I'll make sure there's a line of text in there saying you have been scuttled. Huh. He has thought this far ahead. He knows the player base so well. Okay. <laughs> so I want to see if he's come up with a concept like, what if all of a sudden both dwarves and a married couple are female? Hmm. How does that work? Like, I should probably make sure there's something in there that keeps them married, or, you know, or I should put something in there that says they cannot be married all of a sudden. I want to see what his thought processes were. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing is whether or not they'll keep having kids after time. Um, 
the only difference between male and female for most species is just whether or not they have a code tag male or female. Mm-hmm. Um, so dwarves, uh, most intelligent species, won't mate unless they're married. Mm-hmm. So I want to know if you have them married and all of a sudden it's both females, will they both start giving birth to kids? Because all it checks is, are you female? Yes. Are you married? Yes, you have a random chance of becoming pregnant after a certain time. Yeah. So it may wind up being, if you really need a lot of dwarves really quickly or a lot of expendable children, just do this one reaction, come up with a whole bunch of married female, female groups, and there you've got all your dwarven kids that you'll ever need. On the other hand, I think the switch to the male case may wind up becoming more productive for the purposes of uh, militia groups. Okay. In that, uh, if you bring everyone in and make sure the militia group is all is suddenly males, then there's less chance of them wading into battle holding a baby underneath one arm. <laughs> Which and that's a real worry. In that is a legitimate fortress. worry in Dwarf Fortress. Um, particularly because when you're dodging and trying to block an incoming attack, a baby is seen as a viable blocking object. So it's like, oh, I can block with my weapon, I can block with my shield, I can block with my baby. And so you'll have cases where mothers will wind up using their baby as like a meat shield. And this is not a very happy thing, even amongst (laughs) some of the more sadistic of of, of player groups. Yeah. They they just don't see a lot of humor in that. So I, I figure if we can, you know, okay, bring them all in, bam, poof, everyone is now male in this group. Uh, so we don't have this issue about whether or not they'll suddenly start, you know, carrying babies around with them. There you go. That settles one little problem. <laughs> and I'll consider it that much better off. I like, like, how it's just no consideration goes into sort of the, the human rights of the, dwar- I guess, dwarven rights. Um, the dwarven <laughs> rights are notoriously lax when it comes to what the players can do. True. I mean, I guess they can, yeah, dump them off cliffs and just... Dumping off cliffs <laughs> is only the start. We have people <laughs> that will take, oh... I don't need any cheesemakers. I don't need any fisher dwarves. So any migrants that come that are this kind of thing, I will put them in the bottom of my dry moat. And then I will smash them with a a reclining bridge. And then I will not do anything like engrave a memorial slab to their their demise so that they will become ghosts. These ghosts will keep invaders at bay. Hmm. And that's uh, a legitimate and sometimes used... uh, method of preventing enemies from gaining entrance to your fortress and getting rid of those pesky, pesky, worthless migrant dwarves. Oh, all right. Um, I'm not a fan of that. I tried that for a game. I didn't really dig it very much. It mm, seems yeah. like a waste of resources under even the most harsh of views. I mean, you can turn your cheese-making dwarf into a useful dwarf doing something else long enough. Mm, they don't have to just make cheese. <laughs> You can give them other titles. You can just put them in the militia. Just make them like a you know meat fodder for you know an incoming siege. At least yeah. they're useful that way. You can do something with them, but uh, apparently not everyone thinks the way I do. <laughs> for better or worse. Uh, so yeah, I'm, I'm working on some of the fun stuff, seeing what what I can do, and testing out the uh, the inner workings of the game in ways I don't think anyone has yet. Oh, that's, that's really cool. Um, so, uh, yes, portraits. and yes. Uh, cool. yes, I saw a movie last night. And a movie. Uh, yes, it was one oh. of the classic <laughs> horror movies from Universal Pictures. Yeah. House of Frankenstein. So, uh, how many of this? How many of these have you watched now? Um, I think I'm missing the Bride of Frankenstein and Evil of Frankenstein. But the Evil of Frankenstein is on next week. Okay. And so I'll get caught up on that. I don't know why they haven't played Bride of Frankenstein. Maybe they're saving that for a female monster month. Okay. Yeah. They do theme months every once in a while. Um, and so the House of Frankenstein, though, I, I, like, I've like i seen a lot of movies. And I grew up watching some very bad movies. I am yeah. okay with a lot of the movies that are on everybody's worst movie ever list. Yeah. Howard the Duck, I enjoyed it. Garbage Pail Kids, I was enraptured by it. I didn't think they were the best movies, of course, but I was able to be entertained by them at a young age. Okay, yeah. This one, uh, The House of Frankenstein, when I got done watching it, I said to myself, well, they really could have done that a lot better. Mm. Not a bad movie. Yeah. Uh, I mean, it had a Dracula, it had uh, Frankenstein's monster, it had the original Wolfman, the Larry Talbot uh, from the you know the, the original series, played by the same actor still, and it had a mad scientist, uh, an Igor and a gypsy lady. 
So there was a decent number of personalities and archetypes that tend to fit within the monster, you know, movie roles. Yeah, it sounds like a winner so far. Unfortunately, it was very much divided. Dracula came apart, uh, about in the first bit. Uh, the traveling, you know, horror show has the bones of Dracula. The guy opens up a coffin and there's a skeleton in there with the, you know, hands over in the cross position with mm-hmm. a stake through the heart. Cool. Um, okay. And he tells these as Dracula's bones and, and, you know, in a fit of rage after being kind of ridiculed by a guy who, uh, who like, shoved his brother out of town a few years ago. Uh, he pulls out the stake and within the matter of seconds it comes back you know like the skin forms and clothes form too apparently Dracula comes back fully uh, clothed which is might be just a conceit of the time you don't want a naked guy running around (laughs) Um, or maybe it's something supernatural I don't know I'm not one to proclaim you know I know exactly what happens when you unstake a vampire well ghosts often have clothes for some reason but the clothes they died in most cases okay yeah uh, in this case the reason why he was just down to a skeleton was because of either sunlight or rot and and so uh, Dracula comes back well he would have been buried in clothes right uh, well apparently the burial didn't stick so you know I mean the guy's moving the coffin around from countryside to countryside yeah. you know for a few bits I'll let you see the corpse of Dracula just a skeleton now but you know Hmm. And so um, the Dracula, you know, he, he comes back and the guy says, uh, the mad scientist is what he really is. Yeah. Says, you know, if you will arrange for the destruction of my enemy, the guy who drove his brother out of town so many years ago, um, you know, I will watch your coffin every day while you sleep. I will be your eternal day guard. And Dracula finds this pretty appealing. A guy who will voluntarily watch over the coffin. Now that's a guy you want by your side. Dracula knows the benefit of good organization, who to mind control, who's doing what willingly. Do what, Who played Dracula, by the way? Uh, it was not the standard one. I believe, if I'm not mistaken, it was the, uh, David Carradine, the uh, the famed actor. He was a much skinnier Dracula than, than most people uh, will remember. Okay. Uh, so, yeah, he's there, and he's dapper and all that, and he falls in love with the lady who's... Was this movie in color, by the way? No, it was all black oh, and white. Okay. He falls in love with the lady who may be like a reincarnated soul of his lost love. Blah, blah, blah. Same sort of thing happens with whatever, you know, Dracula usually gets up to. Uh, And so long story short, because, well, it's only the first third of the movie, uh, the mad scientist, uh, his Igor, you know, like henchman assistant, he's not named Igor, but he's an Igor. It's a role (laughs) type. Um, They're running away from, you know, like... uh, the police, because Dracula's kidnapped another lady for it to become one of his unholy brides. Okay. And uh, so they need to get away, and uh, they know they're, it's Dracula the guy's going after, and they got to keep Dracula from coming after him, so they sh- throw the coffin out the back of their wagon. And uh, long story short again, uh, Dracula winds up uh, getting exposed to the, the light of sun, and bam, back to being a skeleton he goes. Mm. Um, and that's his only role in the movie. He doesn't interact with any of the other uh, uh, oh, two he's monsters just shows up as a, he's <laughs> in the first third. The other two monsters are in the the other two thirds, and that's like about it. There's very minimal interaction between any of these roles. Okay, and then later on, uh, Larry Talbot and by extension the werewolf, he becomes once or twice a month, depending on how the full moon phase goes. It, long story short, allows you to have like a werewolf twice a month. Sometimes it's a storytelling convenience. Yeah. Uh, has very he talks about the uh, the you know Dracula or sorry about the Frankenstein's monster. They don't really interact. They're not really in any of the same scenes together. Okay. And so from it, I got the whole perspective of uh, there were some nice character concepts like the gypsy girl falling in love with Larry Talbot, and you know despite him being a monster, and you know there's love triangle because the Igor ha- assistant you know wants the the gypsy girl, the only late person he's ever loved. You know, so there's a love triangle, a decent love triangle, because, I mean, you know, one of them turns out to be a werewolf. I'm sure, that's a nice twist on a plot. I'll go with that triangle. Yeah. The mad scientist is making promises to everybody, like, uh, to the Igor, you know, I'll make you, you know, an Adonis when I'm done with this work. To Larry Talbot, he says, get me uh, the workings of, uh, you know, uh, Victor von Frankenstein, his notes, and I can uh, switch your brain out with someone else's, and then you'll never be a werewolf again. And he's making all these big ground rules promises doesn't really seem to even try to keep them you know he mm. keeps saying mm-hmm. oh, you're yeah. gonna have to keep doing what i say because i'm the only one who can help you out it's either this or you'd be damned to be a hunchback or you know a werewolf for the rest of your life now are these all villains or how does this like some of them were very sympathetically portrayed the uh 
the henchman uh, uh, assistant, uh, the Igor, uh, was very much seen as a lonely character, mm-hmm. despite the fact he whips Frankenstein's monster in a fit of rage and winds up strangling the doctor to death. Uh, oh, almost <laughs> to death. Oh, is that a spoiler? Oh, too late. <laughs> The movie's like 70 <laughs> years old. If you haven't seen it by now, I'm sorry. Spoiler alerts go away after a certain period of time. Well, uh, it's I, like, it's okay. like saying <laughs> King Kong dies at the end. Oh, no. Sorry about the spoiler. Okay. No, no. It's been around long enough. Sorry. Spoilers <laughs> don't count no more. <laughs> sorry. <Gee. laughs> there is a statute of limitations. I'm calling it here and now. But uh, in the end, I, like, I would have really preferred to have seen like, a movie where... Like, maybe they put Dracula back in, you know, his, his coffin, because, well, you know, now you got a skeleton, you know, it's half inside a coffin. What do you do with him? Put him in the coffin, and hey, there's no stake to him. He comes back again. And so he shows up at the end as, you know, oh, you've betrayed me. I'm going to kill you so dead, dang it. Yeah. And actually have the monsters interact with each other. Um, I think that may be one of the reasons why I like the Underworld series, why I did. Sure, it was a yeah. bit of a rip-off of the World of Darkness and Anne Rice's stuff, but at least the vampires and the werewolves interacted with each other, dang it. <laughs> they weren't in the same movie not touching each other and were just talking about each other, and that's the only interaction they had, so... All right. Well, I want to ask you about that, because I think that's a good simulationist, like, uh, short topic to, to cover, mm-hmm. in that, like, if, is that essential? Because remember, you brought up one time how you wanted to write a novel. Yes. But you said, well, maybe not a novel, maybe a series of short stories. But if you put all the same short stories in the same book, all these short stories in the same book, don't people have an expectation that they have to relate to each other more than just thematically? Um, well, and, so that's, that's and a good thing. you see the movie as, as the same sort of deal. But they were all happening at the same time. They were just like in the next room sort of yeah. thing. And there was no reason why they can't, you know, like help out. Why, why is Larry Talbot just moping around for the rest of the month? Oh, I'm going to kill someone the next time I'm a werewolf. Why isn't he helping out the doctor's work to make sure the doctor gets the answers he needs to do the brain transplant? By the way, they're using the same old, oh yeah, I'll just put another brain in you and then you'll be fine sort of thing. They had very little proper neuropsychological knowledge back then, as it turns out. Time, you know, makes a fool of all people. Yeah. But, so yeah, and, you know, and that's what he was going to do, was really take Larry Talbot's brain out and put a new brain in there. And uh, then, hey, Larry Talbot would be fine, because apparently it's the brain that makes him think he's becoming a werewolf. At least according to the movies they did back then, it was a very yeah. psycho. It was like like hyper psycho psychosomatic, that because he really does believe he'll be a werewolf. His mentality causes the physical change. That's what makes him go. Theoretically, anybody with like enough mental training could become a werewolf. Just like 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 a, like rage out like the Hulk. Okay. Is Which, it, by the way, yeah. I think is a pretty darn awesome idea. <laughs> Hulk werewolf. What? Well, the thing is, this little, the Hulk, whenever you know uh, Bruce Banner gets angry, he hulks out. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so it's a man- mental phase change in his mind. In this case, if you were to hypnotize Larry Talbot into removing the restriction about the full moon, or at least close to full, because he does believe for a couple nights he'll turn into a werewolf. Right. Um, you could have a situation whereby he can have any trigger be it the trigger for it being a werewolf. So... He could recite. They, they in the, the movies they have a, like a, a little quartet, a little four line stands about what it's like to be a werewolf. They could make it that. So whenever he says like a, the invocation, you know, yeah. of of, of the, describing the werewolf, he could become one. And then you could have it. Uh, you could have a really interesting perspective then about uh, the whole thing. I'm glad they kept it more traditional. But I'm thinking if you want to do your own werewolf movie. Work on that as a base. Then you've got a classic baseline comparison. And then you'd say, I'm taking this a new direction. I want to see how far we can go with this line of thought. Bam. You've got your own movie that still has some nice roots in the, the classic. And I don't believe any of that is under uh, proper lock and key for property rights. So you could take that wholesale. I'm not a lawyer, but... I think, yeah, certain interpretations of the universal monsters are still under copyright, which is why... But the concept that uh, where a lycanthropy is a psychosomatic illness, I don't believe no, is yeah, a no, copyrighted no, no. thing. So you can utilize that as your premise. Say, yes, it does have you know historical movie connotational roots, uh, yeah. but I didn't have to pay a dime to Universal Film... Uh, Still kept uh, some of their ideas, though. But I'm taking this in a whole direction. I'm seeing exactly how far we can go with this line of thought. They never did. I'm doing it, dang it. Now watch my movie. Pay ten, fifteen dollars per ticket. I do wonder, like, can you make a movie and like have audiences 
I, I don't know, buy into a movie. Like, what if what if it, it was entirely psychological and the person like didn't actually physically transform? But I would love that sort of thing. Just where a guy just goes way. nuts. Yeah. He he has it in his mind, and you could have it so that he you know he sees himself as the werewolf. You only ever see the werewolf in reflections when he's doing okay. it, That's and then in the end it turns out no, dude, we got photographic evidence. We got this sort of stuff. He's You're not actually right. turning a werewolf. That's all in your head, and it's just like a crazy guy going nuts on like bath salts sort of thing. <laughs> I think that would be a great twist in the end. It's like the mo- the monster is in your mind. Anyone can be a true monster if they have it within themselves, you know, up here in the brain. Yeah, and okay, so audiences wouldn't be... Well, I mean, it's hard to say if, if people want to see, like, that monster, you know, the werewolf in the movie. Well, right? so the thing is, they get to see it from the okay, per- first-person yeah, perspective. He looks, yeah. oh, no, I'm turning into a werewolf, and then they, they do that, you know, like, take a few shots of you... Then we'll put some more makeup on, take a few more shots, you and do that transition where it's, you know, oh no, and then all of a sudden he's a werewolf. They did it in a historical like transformation sequence. It's a very nice classic uh, horror movie, monster movie trick. Yeah, I think I'm picturing it in my, ma- in my brain, but uh, you can probably find examples on YouTube. I might link one. Just um, that said, be careful about doing it with the Howling series. They did a whole lot of different transformations throughout, and that was, you know a different trick altogether sort of thing for most okay. of them. Yeah. Um, but yeah, you could have it so that that's just all in his mind and no, you know, like, no, we had like this, this thing recording up in the corner. You're just staring at yourself for 20 seconds and you jump through a window. Yeah. Nothing changed. So for those people who are watching this movie, which somebody is writing now and then we'll Fingers film crossed. In, fingers crossed. They film it in 2015 and it gets released in 2016. So spoiler alert, <laughs> he's not really a werewolf. <laughs> Well, that's the thing is, I remember a few movies where, like, the addition of it actually being supernatural, or, you know, the monster actually coming in was like, oh, you had a really nice idea going. Like, um, The Descent, a bunch of ladies go into a cavern complex, uh, and then they they get stuck. The only potential way to get out is by exploring the whole thing. Uh, I loved that, and it was almost a shame when uh, the monsters showed up. It is a monster movie, so yeah, they're like cave people in there that are acclimated for blind sight conditions. Some sort of evolutionary, like... It's a standard uh, Lovecraftian thing, yeah. Yeah, It's like, oh, and then they became creatures of the eternal dark night sort of thing. Uh, But honestly, it could have been a very tense psychological uh, thing about maybe these ladies are trapped, and it's very confinedly trapped, because, boy, do they get it right. Like, when they're trying to get through some of the cracks and wedges in there. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, I mean, my <laughs> wife and I, we had to pause the movie, we had to turn on some lights, and we just had to stretch ourselves out, just because it was so confinedly well done there. Yeah. It was, oh, wonderful cinema on that part. So they but didn't even need the monsters, really. They, they could have made it just intense psychological, because there was some stuff happening, like, uh, oh, no, uh, turns out, Lady A has had an affair with the deceased husband of Lady B, and you know that's you know like then all of a sudden you have to be in a cave complex and really trust someone you have no right to trust, and so you could really have worked that up as a theme, uh, but no, there's uh you know a cannibalistic uh, cave people, yeah, deal with them well, now. And I, we've touched a little bit on this too before, but whenever there's a movie with a supernatural or a weird element like that, I often do think to myself maybe the whole movie really was just a metaphor or something like maybe it didn't really happen so remember I told you about Labyrinth how I thought it was just the story she was telling her brother that would have been a nice twist too yeah, yeah. and so so with this movie it's like maybe all of that really was sort of an elaborate fiction that she just came up with and maybe she really did just kill her friends mm. in the cavern <laughs> well yeah. here's the other thing though is that uh, I remember one movie about a lady whose kid went missing and she was looking for the kid and no one knows the kid not her oh, husband. I think, yeah, I remember yeah. This recent movie. Uh, within the last ten years, I can't remember the name. But in the end, uh, it was aliens conducting an experiment. They, you know, like abduct the kid and then erase the memory from the minds of you know everyone else. But for some reason, it's not sticking with the one mom. She can still mm-hmm. remember. And uh, I would have loved it if it wasn't aliens. If she was just having a horrible mental breakdown and it was all in her mind. The kid never mm. actually was. Yeah. I would have considered that to be such such as uh, like a deep, deep depressing ending. It would have been so much better than... Uh, better yeah, it was, it was aliens. <laughs> it was aliens. She can remember. And according to the alien, you know, like... Uh, mental, you know, like, testing program in their whole sciences department, if you fail a test, you die and everything gets reverted. Ah, that, so that's how... That, spoilers again, but for the movie we can't remember the title of, but... 
Yeah, and so in the end, you know, she gets her kid back, and everyone suddenly remembers the whole thing, and it's oh, all like back to how it was. Oh, they didn't kill her. In, okay. No, no, she she won this, you know, the science experiment. Okay. Um, and I consider that it's like, oh, okay, yeah, she gets her kid back, but it would have been better if. And I remember another movie about a guy who who hates like uh, doors and hidden things. He can't have any covered doors because he believes in a boogeyman that abducted his dad when he was young. Turns out, yeah, there is a boogeyman. Um, uh, <laughs> there's a boogeyman around. You can't go, like, you know, stuff like that. It's scary. Woo, I guess. Would have been better if it turns out he had just seen his father die, get, like, murdered because he owed money to a mob? I don't know. Whatever reason. Yeah. Just gets murdered in front of his eyes, and he built up this elaborate psychological delusion so that he doesn't have to remember seeing the death of his own father. Yeah. I think that ending would have been better. Sometimes you could do a really good movie without needing the supernatural. You don't need to have the monster. Yeah, well, you you definitely don't need it, but, I mean, the point of movies is because we have access to special effects, we want to use them. We want to use these crazy puppets and these tricks. To but sometimes a really good, you know, uh, mind screw is a damn fine movie. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and they're I not it's doing just that a creative call. Like you just yeah, they're not doing, I think, the, the mind screw often enough to make it work. And, uh, mm. well, you don't want to do it too often, otherwise you become like M. Night Shyamalan, and everyone says, oh, it's got to be this. It's, I didn't figure this ending out. It was going to be a twist, definitely. <laughs> Yeah, he made one good movie. And he made a few <laughs> decent movies, i got to say. There's a, a few, I want at least two great movies. Okay. Um, I, I think all of them were at least decently made. Okay, well, uh, well we've well, established he was still your doing, taste. Well, he was <laughs> still doing the twist, at least decently made and all that. Yeah. Uh, whether or not you like that kind of movie, that's up to you. But I think uh, it, it, quality cinema, you can at least monitor it and say, oh, I like how this angle's being used here how they frame the shot there. You can learn from it. It's not like he's like, oh, it's complete garbage. Yeah. You can still study it. It's a it's a movie. <laughs> yeah. It's a perfectly adequate way to spend an hour and a half to two hours of your time. Okay. So Maybe not the best way, but whatever. Glowing review there. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I think there's a few of his movies that are just absolutely excellent. Uh, yeah, yeah. I won't say them, because then you'll think, oh, it's a spoiler if you haven't seen them. <laughs> These are ones you definitely want to avoid the spoilers on, because they truly come, yeah. and it's like, oh! <gasps> It was in front of my eyes the entire time, and I never saw it. And that's the kind of, of uh, spoiler I don't want to give away, no matter how well, old the movie I is. I know you don't want to, but it's probably the case that this is the one that other people have been... Look for his, some of his earlier works. I think he okay. had, uh, when people weren't expecting what was coming out of him for a theme. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, right, cool. Um, but, uh, oh, I do have an extra oh, little bit. Another thing. Um, my experiments in Dwarf Fortress have inspired me to do a little bit of short story writing. Oh, good, good. Yes, I was doing some testing out in, in turning a person into a vampire, uh, and it uh, turns out the first person the vampire ate, uh, sucked the blood out of, was his uh, the person he was in a whirlwind romance with before he became a vampire. Okay, makes sense. And then so afterwards... Oh, it's actually just supposed to be random. I'm this hungry, and there's a sleeping person that no one else is looking at. Oh, I will go and feed on them. Yeah. So it turns out it's uh, like his uh, his lover. He gets really depressed by this because, dude, it was his lover, and you suffer negative like happiness points from losing a loved one. And uh, because there was only so many dwarves, when I'm establishing dwarven justice, he helps... Uh, carve out the prison cells, he helps smooth the prison cell walls, and he helps make the uh, the restraints that later get used to put him into jail. Hmm. And so then uh, I decided, well, you know what, he's in jail, he's uh, tethered up, I put the uh, the coffin that has the uh, the body of his deceased loved one in the, the spot next to him, and then I wall him off, and then that's the ending there. He helped secure his own prison, and he is now forever with his love. I think it's not the greatest short story, but at least it's something to write. Does he technically live in that? He like, lives I mean, forever. Like, yeah. Okay. <laughs> Very hungry, but unable to hurt any more people he cares about. Okay. It's yeah. for his own best, uh, you know, it's for the best for everyone. Uh, except maybe with the diplomats who may wind up fi- trying to find where he is. He turned out he was the uh, the expedition leader. Okay. Like the mayor. Yeah. Uh, so when a diplomat comes by... It might be rather difficult for him to talk to a guy through a wall. Yeah, sure. Uh, once again, spoilers, I guess. <laughs> well, not just basic you know, thing. You can't talk to creatures through a wall. You have to be able to see them. I could have put some bars in and make them be forever behind bars, but no, I went with walling himself off in uh, yeah. in his own little uh, tomb next to his deceased uh, loved one. 
Well, do you think, like, thousands of years later, like, after his civilization, I don't know, abandons their fortress... All dwarves are dead, and then civilization has crumbled. Then the rise of humanity happens, <laughs> and then humans come along with an archaeological team. He will still be alive. He will be very insane, very unhappy, uh, incredibly hungry. Oh, great. Well, I pity those humans. Um... But well, that's the thing, though, is, is that uh, dwarves will go very unhappy if they're confined, if they lose their clothing, uh, and if, you know, they're hungry. And so eventually he's going to go, like, maybe start raving insane at one point because he will be naked, tied up, and uh, starved. <laughs> Great. But, you know, so long as nobody, you know, on, you know, chips away at the wall, he's forever confined with his loved one. And I figured, you know, that's worth at least a little story, a little short story writing. Yeah, it won't hit the tally for you know, Nano Ramo, but whatever. No, I, hey, uh, a little story I think is something to share with the people. Like this happened, and this is all random, and this is how it got set up. Yeah. Do you have, have you already posted it? Or no, I'm still fun? writing it. I want to make sure it's oh, at least decent quality. Okay, yeah. Cool. Um, good. So yeah, just a little something. It's a a good story cropped up in my experiments, and so I decided to write it out. Excellent. Well, that's what's yeah. You never know where inspiration comes from. You just got to keep paying attention as to what's going on. Like if I had not checked to see, like, oh, who did he eat? Oh, that was his his lover. They were in a whirlwind relationship, a romance. They had just mm-hmm. started up, and it's like, oh, uh, and then he drank her blood and killed her. Yeah. <laughs> it's uh, like no, and then why I noticed. Is it funny. Oh, well, it's, it's a bit of a dark humor sort of thing. And then I noticed, well, wait a minute. Uh, he's digging out his own prison cell. He's smoothing the walls. Hey, he's also the guy, you know, making his own restraints. So that gets all put up, and then he gets imprisoned in there, and then, uh, well, what can I do to cap this off? Put the sarcophagus in there, wall it back up again. <laughs> well, yeah. The end. Cool. So, yeah, just a nice little bit. Uh, inspiration can find, come from anywhere. Just keep paying attention. Very good. So we, have we covered all of our simulations that we've been running? Uh, I think there's one uh, to mention. Oh, no, no, no. Uh, not for what we've done, but what uh, they've done down in America for uh, the kid with leukemia. The simulation run by the city of San Francisco. Yes. Uh, uh, Make-A-Wish Foundation. There's a young child. He has leukemia. It's in remission. Fingers crossed, everyone. He recovers. Okay. But, you know, he suffered a lot, and so he's on the Make-A-Wish uh, list. And he wanted to be like Batman for a day. So the city, by and large, complied with him. And um, he got to be a bat kid. He got to go around in a Lamborghini with a bat decal, you know, with Batman and, you know, uh, save a lady from this and rescue that and put the Joker behind, or not the Joker, was the Riddler, the behind Riddler. bars. And they got, you know, a thank you from President Obama. Everyone went along with this. And I love the concept. Um, yeah, get a whole city in on it. I yeah, the the uh, the chief of police, he really gave a stirring speech. Like, like uh, we're in dire help, Batman. We call upon you to help save the day and bring Bat Kid with you. <laughs> we will need his expertise as well. And he really sounded sincere. I was watching this like, wow, you know, if I didn't know better, I'd swear this was either real or this guy had gone really off the deep so end. So was Ben Affleck in on this too? Or No, it was uh, a professional, uh, just a Batman impersonator that goes about. Like they have like uh, Superman impersonators and one Spider-Man impersonators. One of these guys on the streets, basically. Uh, not or on the streets. Not they, they have like licensed things so that Batman will show up for this or go do that. So it wasn't a famous actor, but it's no. a guy who, who is known for He knows Batman. to do the line. He knows how to act like Batman at all points in time. Okay. <laughs> well, the good Batman, not the crazy psychotic Batman you occasionally see. <laughs> He's more driving with a kid. I mean, the Lamborghini did not speed off. It did have a police escort everywhere they went. That was kind of nice. Oh, that's pretty cool. I mean, yeah, it's, and I think that's what we're all about. We're about, like, sort of this uh, larger-than-life sort of theater of everybody. Like, the, the world becomes a stage. Well, that's the thing is, is you have, you know, your, your dinner theater where sometimes people get pulled up on stage and they become part of the scene. Yeah. This one, an entire city, by and large, co-opted in to help, you know, like, live the dream of one kid. He had a great time, apparently. I hope so, yeah. <laughs> you I mean, better have... Uh, <laughs> I mean the poor guy. I mean it's funny because it it doesn't it doesn't make him better, but I suppose it, it at least he got to live the dream. If everything goes worse for him, at least he got to be Batman or Bat Kid for a yeah. day. Yeah. He got to live the dream. He got to have it in the brief time he had, which let's face it is uh, something you should wish upon everybody. I wish you get at least that one day where you get to be the person you always want to be. And if the kid winds up having cancer, you know, leukemia and all that, and he needs the radiation stuff, 
He might not make it that far. Let's make sure he can get that one day. He's endured enough as is. Let's make sure he has one great day to remember for all the rest of his life, which is hopefully a very long time yet. Yeah. And, well, and I, I will also mention that it touches... It, I mean, yes, it's it's wonderful for this kid, but he, in making this wish, he actually enriched the lives of a lot of other people. Yeah, there were people cheering him on. They got to see the kid be bat kid. You <laughs> yeah. know, they got to see him save the the lady. You know, who's tied up next to the whatever it is. You know, like the explosive device. He has to pull out the the wires to stop it from counting down. Yeah, <laughs> and he does that, and everyone's cheering one. They got to be a part of that. So vicariously. They got to be Bat Kid for a little bit too, so it, it really does make their lives a little richer. Yeah, and I suppose all of us, like the people who do podcasts and talk about stories like this, we get our little piece well, of excitement th- out of it. I think, given the news this week, uh, a story about a kid who got to be Bat Kid for a day, I think that's a great change of pace. Yeah. I do want to point it from this perspective of, of a conspiracy, because you know me, I'm oh, always yeah. about the conspiracies. Yeah. A conspiracy doesn't necessarily need to be a bad thing; it can be a great thing. Was this lady tied up to the thing, you know, really, you know, going to potentially, you know, die if the countdown went too long? No. <laughs> no, she wasn't. She was never in any real harm. Wasn't really the Riddler. Wasn't really Batman. He wasn't really Bat Kid. Yeah. But that doesn't make the conspiracy bad. The conspiracy was great. It's like the, uh, oh, if you're too young, uh, skip ahead about five minutes. If you, uh, you know, if it's like the conspiracy with Santa Claus. <laughs> okay. It's not a bad thing. You know, as, as soon yeah. as you learn about it, you become on the other side. You become part and parcel of keeping it from the other kids. Don't spoil it for them. This is a good thing for them. The Santa Claus conspiracy is is a good thing, um, especially from the marketing perspective, because you know, toy sales and all that. But uh, it's a good conspiracy. The Bat Kid stuff, where the entire city went in on this whole thing to to make him be Bat Kid for the day and have him save the day. Conspiracy yeah. by its pure standards, but a very, very nice thing. It was a wonderfully benevolent thing. So, mm-hmm. just something to put out, out for as a purpose. As a, just because a lot of people are hiding something doesn't necessarily, it's for sinister purposes. Well, I like this too because it is evidence that a lot of people can work together for a cause. I mean, we have lots of examples. of. You have to believe together. in the cause for <laughs> it to work, though. And that's, yeah, that's, yeah. that's a nice way of dispelling a lot of other conspiracy theories. It's like, oh, yes, uh, uh, the government engineered 9-11. Uh, they'd have to have a cause to believe in it that much. Because, I mean, look at Obamacare. Right now, they can't get the website working properly. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it is uh, just a travesty. Yeah. So apparently they can somehow organize and keep properly secret one of the worst disasters on American soil, but they can't get a website to work. Yeah, I, I, that's so the there's, old argument yeah. about yeah, so, government competency and conspiracy. Exactly, and, and so to have it work, especially for a government conspiracy, all the people involved would have to believe what they're doing is right to make sure they keep secret and become a part of it. Yeah, and, and of course that's a level that they didn't have, but I mean you can imagine, like what if they really went to full immersion and we're like, okay, no, we don't talk about how this is fake. Like, everything is real. Like, we're really Gotham, sort of. Like, because some, in Ren Faire, sometimes they, they do a little bit of that. They, like, stay in character. Speak not ye of the, <laughs> more of the mortal ages yet to come. Exactly, yeah. But imagine, like, getting a whole city to try and do that and be like, no, you're Gotham. <laughs> you can kind of get that for large portions during Halloween. Yeah, um, yeah. St. Patrick's Day sometimes needs a little alcohol to <laughs> lubricate the wheels, but there's a lot of people willing to at least try and put on a little bit of green and a fake bad accent. And they're going to give it a try. I like that. Like I don't, I don't know if I've ever, if a, an entire city has ever taken on. I mean, cities have done cool things before. Yeah, for yeah. Sure. But have they like sort of put on a costume like that? Like an entire city, like the city is wearing a costume almost. Like the that city is, is good co- cosplay. Very <laughs> nice to see. Um, Maybe during some points during like the the big conventions they will at least adopt the attitudes like oh hey mm-hmm. there's a Super Bowl going on we're all fans of one of these teams we'll put on the jersey even though we really don't know who got there yeah you know we just know it's this team and that team and what they had to go through to get there we don't know we'll put on one jersey and woo root for them woohoo yeah yeah and well we've also talked about running of the Bulls yeah example, oh yeah which is like it transforms a city for a little while so it's part of a, a larger festival if I'm not yeah. Kidding. And I don't know. I don't think the running of the bulls takes place all over town. I think it's just the one proper, well-defined area. But everyone gears up for it, and everyone's knowledgeable about what's going on when. Yeah, yeah. Because you don't want to find yourself suddenly, whoa, bulls, 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 whoa. 
I thought yeah, rush yeah. hour traffic was bad here. Uh, although I was surprised by it. we have a we have a parade in Victoria, but like a, a Christmas time truck parade. And I was oh yeah, I saw that one time. So oh yeah, what is all that honking? Because <laughs> like it's all the truckers and yeah, yeah. trucks of all sizes. Like just not just the eighteen wheelers. <laughs> Like yeah, tow trucks and you know uh, ambulances too, and fire trucks and, and everybody—they're all you know honking their horns like crazy. So it's and yet really not a la cucaracha to be heard. What I, well, society do we live in? <laughs> I don't remember hearing any of that. So yeah, exactly. But yeah, it kind of scared me a little. Bit. <laughs> like, well, it's designed to. I mean, you hear a horn honk once, okay, it's an alert. You hear a lot of horns honking. That's something you got to pay attention for. Well, so that means you've I, got good <laughs> driver sense. So it's like a bell curve because you know one horn honk, it's like okay, well maybe somebody accident or somebody's doing something funny. You know, a little higher up on the bell curve, it's like okay, you know, people are honking. They're like, there's maybe something happened or they're. Did mad. someone have a heart attack <laughs> in the street? Like, like it's just like protecting you know people from you know like like driving over top of this heart attack person. <laughs> yeah. But you a little bit further along the bell curve, and I guess we we go over the top a little bit, and it's. Okay, this is a wedding. <laughs> There's so much honking. It's either a wedding or the the local, you know, sports team or one. A sports team one or ah or ah. Okay, so I interpret. There's not a wedding going on in my sight. We must have got the winning goal. Okay, now I know. And now I can hunt too. <laughs> sure. Yeah. Why not? Uh, but uh, yeah. So you know. Different levels, but uh, I like to know that uh, you have a good enough driver since you hear a lot of you know horns honking. You're looking around to see what's going on. I guess so. Some people get rather blasé about that, and then they just don't pay attention, and then all of a sudden, oh no, they got hit by bulls. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> bulls don't honk, do they? Do they? I wanted, I imagine it would be nice to have the honking to keep them well confined, you know, as they're running their course. Do you think a, a, a horn, a really loud horn would... Not one, but several of them. I think three to Maybe. four could probably keep them from wanting to like, turn down this alley or, you know, go down that street. Maybe, possibly. They work on a herd mentality at that stage, and so if you can get the front ones to keep going in and keep the other ones slightly away, they won't disperse so readily. Okay, yeah. It's it's something from their, you know, uh, pastoral grazing days before they were domesticated. It's still in their genetics. Sure, yeah. Well, we do have the Gotacon to speak about, uh, I suppose. Uh, one more week down, one week closer. Yes, Gotacon, Victoria, British Columbia, February 2014. Um, tickets are already on sale on the Gotacon website. I am going to be there. You are going to be there. Uh, at least as a participant. Um, yeah, basically. Participant. Don't forget, this year it is at a different location, not at the Perks Recreation Center like it has historically been. It's grown too big for even Perks. <laughs> yeah. Or maybe we're upsetting like the people who do the uh, the ice rink skating. I don't know. Uh, they've been moved over to uh, just on the backside of the Empress Hotel. Wonderful convention center there. Beautifully done. Lots of rooms for everybody and everything. Uh, yeah, I think there's going to be multiple floors, and there's going to be tons of stuff going on, so just check it out there at the, what, gotacon.com, I think. Got, and, that's gotacon, G-O-T-T-A-C-I. As in, I gotta go to this con. Yes. But, uh, yeah, don't forget to keep checking up. They keep having uh, updated lists, who's got what announcements, when uh, this tournament's going on, what they've been able to add because of popular demand. So if you haven't seen something you, you liked immediately, go back. Maybe you'll find uh, exactly what's up your alley. And even if you don't, I mean, they got a lot of stuff where you can watch. So if you don't know whether or not you'd like the Warhammer universe. Yeah, sit, on, sit in on somebody playing a awesome game of very beautiful painted miniatures. Hopefully beautifully painted <laughs> miniatures. No one likes to lose to an unpainted army. Well, there's going to be a there's going to be a wide vari- of array variety of different skills levels per- present there. A continuum Some, of experience. There definitely are. You want to check it out because there are some really skilled skilled painted um, stuff. I mean, so, uh, some of the landscapes I've seen alone, especially for stuff like the Blood Bowl, beautifully done. Just, like, it must have taken hundreds of hours to get appropriate. Multiple layers, some fake moss here and there. Totally worth watching. Yeah. And it really does add an extra little bit to the game as opposed to just a standard flat grid. Yeah, but of course don't be intimidated either because there are other people who just throw it together and just want to play. Just yeah, yeah. It's oh, just yeah, it's cool always too. nice to see that background every once in a while. You don't have to do it. Uh, if you got the time and the money. A beautiful yeah. set. So yeah, so gotta con be there. Uh, so uh, So yeah, so that's uh, I think all the fun notes for this week. Uh, <laughs> oh yeah, we've had all our fun. Now we're gonna get on to the serious well, we've the main topic as serious as we ever get on this podcast. Which I mean, admittedly we 
we try to get to the root of sort of We delve deep, but I don't think we're ever that deep about it. Um, anyways, um... Yes, you had a nice topic for today, I believe. Uh, well, I wanted to talk about character acting when it comes to nerds. So, like, why is it that, like, it? Well, let me let me ask this question: Is it difficult in a, to play a nerd in a TV show or a? I think it's movie? harder to play a nerd in a, the TVs or movies than it is to play like um, uh, most other you know uh, archetypes or, or uh, stereotypes. Because yeah. nerds demand authenticity. Yeah. This is the reason why we have the whole fake gamer girls problem. Yeah, yeah. So the, the, you know, if they were as knowledgeable as everyone else about it, or as knowledgeable as the geeks that are having the issue about it, there wouldn't be a problem. But uh, they say, oh, do you know enough to be a geek like me? And so if you have a geek in a movie, he has to make either the right references, yeah. or have the references be at least dropped obscurely enough that no one can call them on it. Well, and a lot of that's taken care of by just the writing. And if you have nerds in your... Or not nerds. We'll I, call them nerds. We'll call okay. them nerds. Nerds in your writing team, you know, or the person who wrote the script is, is like, knowledgeable and stuff, then he can cover that with the writing. So it, then it's in the delivery. Like, can you convincingly say the word, uh, I don't know, nuclear is, is a good word. Can you sound <laughs> more nerd. enough like uh, Steve Urkel to, to have it be pulled off as opposed to someone just going through the lines. Well, and I guess the Steve Urkel thing is another question I have about, like, playing nerds, because it's very over-the-top, and yes, there are people in real life who have, like, squeaky voices, and I talk like this, and I can't really get my sentences out, but I'm still pretty smart, uh, like that, and is that nerd? Like, how does... I think that's just so stereotypical, nerd, it became, like, a joke at the, uh, the stereotype. Yeah. Um... Because, oh, let's face it, he was at least half mad scientist by, by what he actually did in the later seasons. And I remember spruce juice and boss sauce getting thrown around as the things you could just drink that would change his DNA. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and the science was so bad, it was, it, 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 you can't see it as anything other than a parody or a satire. Yeah, and, and that, so in that case, yeah. he took refuge in it, it being so over the top. If he had tried to yeah. maintain, like, I'm a real nerd and I want to speak the real, you know, like, nerdy talk, if. Would it have been pulled off the right way? I don't know. Yeah, it's hard to say because, well, I mean, I guess the, the problem is that reality is so varied, and there are really weird people who talk strangely and are also smart, but there are also a lot of people who talk strangely and aren't really that smart. Or <laughs> Well, I'm thinking to the movies, the Revenge of the Nerds series, yeah. and uh, that covered more than just nerds. I mean, there was that one guy, he wasn't smart. Uh, was it Booger? I think it's, yes, it's, his name was Booger. Uh, he wasn't that smart, but he had like the um, what you'd understand in the internet terms as the, the perversions associated with nerdity. Um, okay. This was before the internet, so he was like a prototype for that uh, that sub nerd archetype. Well, you know? did, did he do computer programming or something? Not really. He just kind of went for for he was like a books? skeezer. Uh, I think it's the term they'd use. He would go after women, but he was so socially inept at it. And so, you know, like, unkempt, like, he always had, like, the, the stubble going on, and he kind of got the leery eye. Um, the actor managed to pull it off and make him somewhat lovable. I mean, not everyone can seem lovable after that, especially with a nickname like Booger. <laughs> I mean, that's not, that, that, that takes a lot of work in itself to get over that, to make a you know, Booger lovable character. But, uh, so that had various different types. It had, like, the child prodigy, the guy who's, like, 12 years, 13 years old and going to college. And then had your more stereotypical, like, uh, we work with electronics nerds. Yeah. And, yeah, they were the comic book stuff. Um, and so they managed to encapsulate more than one nerd, which may have been uh, what made them so popular, is all the nerds could find their nerd within the group. So I guess, like, can you, is it just anything? If you wanted to write a nerd for a script or for, say, for a role-playing game for a character, you want to play a nerdy character, um, is it just sort of anything goes, do you think? Or do you think well, like, that's the thing, some things are played out? Or? Some things are played out. Some things have changed with time. Uh, the concept of, of like a scientist being a nerd has really changed. I mean, Indiana Jones is supposed to be like, he's an adventurer, yes, yes. He yeah, goes yeah, out, he whips sure. things. But he's also an archaeologist who does a lot of studying. Yeah, he's and a professor. Yeah, yeah, he's from the era where a scientist was a man of action. And so it was only later on that he became associated with, like, the Poindexter, you know, glasses with tape on it, nerd that doesn't leave his lab. 
Okay. So you could have a person that has all the knowledge groups of the nerd and have them be completely not nerdy by benefit of the fact that uh, they kick ass. Yeah. So for a nerd, one of the things you may have to wind up doing for, for the geek archetypes is be at least initially hesitant to get into the conflict, at least on a physical level. Yeah, if it's sure. a cyber warfare, oh, you're, uh, you're in there mm-hmm. fast and fierce. I suppose then you're the big man online as opposed to the big man on campus. Uh, so you really have to uh, figure out where you're going to pick your fights and how you go about your fight to pull off uh, your stereotype nerd or how you're going to do your, your writing for it. Um, the jock is more closely associated with the person who's willing to start button heads as soon yeah. as you know the opportunity presents itself. I suppose both of these things, being stereotypes, have problems and sort of they're useful as stereotypes. The nerd and the jock and all those mm-hmm. things, they're, they're useful because they tell you, they give you a direction to go, but they can also be a little bit constraining because not everybody's like that. Well, as the thing is, by changing one little part about it, like you could have a person who's... Uh, thin and wiry uh, and, and let's say short maybe you put them five feet tall you know, and but they have a real big yeah. chip on their shoulder because of their size people will make fun of their size they're ready to fight so then you have like a nerdy person with a nerdy uh, style maybe they just got wiry muscles but they're still ready to for a fight and they can hold their own and then you put a little spin on that and so long as you can get uh, enough of the thing you know the the, the stereotype in there mm-hmm. and then uh, put your own uh, little uh, zazz on there you can make it work but you do have to think, like, where am I going to go from the base? You can't just work it into the base. You have to to start and then work out to, to make that, I think, the nerd uh, role work properly. Um, like, we can look at movie, or uh, sorry, the, the small screen instead of the movies, oh, yeah. and uh, work with The Big Bang Theory, the currently most popular <laughs> nerd-based uh, TV series out there. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah and uh, a lot of people say, you know, like uh, they're, what they're talking about really is just in, like a techno babble. It's not true, you know, like deep conversations. Well, not I intellectual. Hear that the scientific stuff they actually re- the, the writers do research. But they do have to they gloss have it over to make sure it's not, you know, like a thirty-minute discussion as to the intricacies of why it is as it is. Well, Which they, is no, what they, nerds they, can get into. They just throw it in, like as a reference. It's like, oh, here's Sheldon working on this super hard, like problem in physics and he he uses the real terms and stuff yeah. and because they were they care about I, got a, they yes. I have a lot of respect for um uh, ma'am by alec who plays his is she properly his girlfriend yet in the series yes sheldon okay. and amy are boyfriend girlfriend shamey yay <laughs> <laughs> i like that we there's have, your power couple name we have benifer brad Jelina, and shamey <laughs> But uh, she actually has done neuroscience, so when she's doing stuff like a brain dissection line stuff, yeah. that's actually how it happens. Oh. And so I have a lot of respect for her making sure she has those little things. And I would be very willing to watch, you know, a TV series that's, you know, or at least an episode two devoted to her so and what she the does. Amy show. Sure, yeah, I would, I would love that sort of thing because she knows enough. She actually knows enough. The other guys had to go and they had to, you know, talk to the people and understand. And I remember when my car was getting its uh, tune-up, reading about, like, uh, what they had to do, you know, to look up. It's like, the first thing that impressed me was, wow, do they drink a lot of caffeine? You know, like, uh, you can't sleep a lot. And you, there's a lot of work to be done, you know, if you want to keep on the, this cutting edge of the curve. So he, he was taking notes before he was actually in the, the role proper as to what it was like to be in part of the nerd or the intelligentsia or whatever term you're going to call it for the okay. people who, who do the work. Right. The nerd can be a bit of a stereotype and the people who yeah. are at the cutting edge don't necessarily see themselves so, you know, yeah, in terms as they so decide. But, uh, so he, he studied up on it whereas Miss Bialik there, she is. She embodies it. She's gone through. She's gotten the degrees. She has all the cred anybody should ever need to ask her when it comes to being nerdy. I, cool. s- I remember her talking with uh, Dana Carvey on the uh, uh, the Conan, sh- uh, you know, O'Brien's show. Okay, yeah. And uh, she was able to, to help him out with a problem with his teenage sons. As to why they're so freaking stupid. Like, he was complaining about how they, they have, like, no concept of the consequences of their actions. They're, like, in their late teens. And she's like, their brains are developing. And she, that's exactly how she explains it. It will come in, sort of thing, but this is what happens here, and it's just is not a fully formed part of their brain, so th- this is why they're not you know, thinking through the consequences of their actions. And he did ask, you do promise me they w- <laughs> this part will develop. It's not a permanent thing. 
And so she was actually able to talk him through because she knows the brain. She's done the okay. work. She's done the study. She's done her thesis. Well, I like that. I mean, I, I think we've had the discussion before about whether actually doing something makes you better at doing it in a movie. Hmm. Um, it's I, I, it really does give you the the little things like anybody yes, can yeah. like we're training a new person at work she can go through a lot of the, the the chores and prep work she doesn't know the little things to make it so much easier the little things that that uh, make it look better give it better presentation and uh, allow you to uh, to utilize everything easier okay she, but that <laughs> comes with experience I guess so I do want to go back to the Big Bang Theory for another example about um, though. They had the astronauts on, like when um, the character... Um, not Hadfield, though, right? Wallowitz. I, well, I don't know if he's been on it, but I'm okay. not thinking of him. And they had a Russian guy, and they had... Um, I'll remember his name after, so I might have to insert it. Um, they had a, one, an actual astronaut oh, that actually okay. been into space, was, like, did a scene in the Big Bang Theory. I Again, but not actual Chris Hadfield. The best astronaut the ever. Best astronaut ever, yes, indeed. Uh, indeed. Um, what was the name of this guy? Anyways, my... my was it Buzz Aldrin? No, no. Okay, he's the celebrity astronaut. It was, it was Mike something. Oh. Mike... Mike the astronaut. Yeah, Mike, you know, from down the street. Yeah, he's <laughs> Mike the astronaut, yeah. Well, he, I think he's an American. Anyways, um, I was... I actually... I mean, not to speak, like, badly about the astronaut, about, <laughs> I guess... Well, I'll just say it. I think he was a bad actor. I think he delivered the line poorly. Um, well, that's because he hasn't been training to be an actor. Well, and that's my, that's the point I'm sort of trying to make, is that even though he's an astronaut and he knows what he's doing, he knows, oh yeah, we're, 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 I'm pretending to be an astronaut. I'm an astronaut <laughs> pretending to be an astronaut, but he doesn't know how to deliver the lines with the proper little bits of inflection yeah, that, so that really give oomph to what he's saying. I, I, yeah, and I think there's something to be said for the acting training to get you... I believe anybody who wants yeah. to make an appearance, small screen or big screen, even if it's a single line, could benefit from at least a single afternoon of speech training. Yeah. If they've got a line to deliver, you want to make sure you deliver it and so that people don't remember you for saying, good astronaut, but he really f just came so flat on his lines. Although I guess, like, the other thing is, you don't want an, act you don't want an astronaut to perform too well as an actor because you'd be like... Hasn't he, what has he been spending his time doing? Ah, Shouldn't he have been training? In the I will form? counter you. The reason why Chris Hadfield is the best astronaut ever is because he produces songs up in space. Or, well, did. He's retired yeah. now, officially. Yeah. But uh, he did, you know, like the ground control to Major Tom, and as he's doing that up there in the space station, and it's beautiful. He did a song with uh, Bare Naked Ladies. ISS is someone singing. Yeah. And it's an amazing song. Yeah. Check that one out, you guys. Uh, it's we'll probably put a link up. It's a great sure, song, yeah, wonderfully done. They got a nice Glee Club singing there too. Absolutely everything you should ever want to hear in a song, wonderfully delivered. Um, that's what made him so great. And he was doing like the like the test. Like people wonder what happens if you ring out like a, a towel in space in zero gravity. What happens? Yeah. He shows you. Well, and so I mean, because he was doing those other things, that's why we love him because we've been able to identify with him because he sings songs and he does things that we he shows can little relate to. little quick science experiments um, for how it works. And it, trust me, seeing like you wring out a cloth and all of a sudden just the water comes out and then just doesn't go anywhere, it's, it's kind of hovering yeah, there. Very cool. I love that stuff. But of course, yeah. it's not what makes it, what makes him great is the fact that he is an astronaut. He knows a lot of like stuff about you know how to fly a spaceship. <laughs> he knows how to get out of orbit. <laughs> You know, surprisingly difficult task. He is technically capable of fixing a spaceship. He's also capable of fixing, like, you know, a toilet in space and all that other stuff. Yeah, well, trust me, <laughs> if there's one thing you want to know how to fix in space, it's got to be the toilet. But uh, Disasters so galore if you don't. It, it's funny because that theatrical stuff, which is sort of what our bread Yeah, it's did. technically above and beyond anything he would be required to know or do. Yeah, exactly. But, but he really <laughs> did help capture, like, the glory of going into space again. I yeah. mean... I've been watching people go to space my entire life. And it's like, okay, yeah, okay, he's going up there, he's going to the thing, he's doing the tests, coming back down, he has to do the, the strength training again to make up for the muscle mass lost. All of a sudden, Chris Hadfield's doing awesome stuff up in space, and he's singing up there, and he's talking yeah. with people on the news. It's like, he's awesome. Yeah. Space <laughs> is awesome. I want everybody to go up to space. I want that, that orbital Hilton they've been talking about to go up there well, now. Well, I've always wanted that, but... <laughs> I want it now more than ever, because he, he really did, you yeah. know, remember help us remember the glory of going into space. Uh, I think I can understand what it was like for the people who first saw man land on the moon. It's like, oh, yeah. 
Oh, space is awesome. I understand you guys now. Yeah, it's not just a routine. Go up there, check this out, fix the Hubble Space uh, Telescope again. They were always fixing that thing. <laughs> I understand. Oh, break it down. To be fair, it was very high precision, and it was very hard to get a maintenance call up there. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, they got, uh, you know, it was for most of my life. It's just, okay, you go up there, you do some stuff, you fix a little thing, you come on back down. Now it's, I, I, I see the, the magic behind it because of the extra stuff he did. Yeah, and so hopefully, like, they'll, NASA will continue to have astronauts who are um, interesting in that and entertaining in that way, like, sort of that they can bring, you know... A little bit more personality than most people remember historically from astronauts. Yeah, and, and I'm not saying that they didn't have good personalities, but... I'm sure they, they had perfectly have fine <laughs> a, a personalities. Yeah. Uh, they just didn't have uh, projective personalities, like yeah. something that people would want to see on TV... Yeah, they can listen yeah, to them exactly. speak. Um, of course, everyone wants to find out what it's like to walk on the moon. It doesn't matter how boring <laughs> you are. You walked on another planetary yeah. body. Yeah. You, you know, describe the difference in weights. Yeah, it doesn't matter how boring you are. It sounds amazing. But uh, when you're just, just up in space, you know, orbiting around so that every 90 minutes you get a new sunrise, Yeah. you need a little extra. Well, although, you know, there is a point sometimes made that maybe we shouldn't be so excited about this uh, low Earth orbit when there are bigger things on our horizon. Like to be Mars. fair, getting up there is still a challenge, and so long as well, we can yeah. get people paying attention, you can get the funding for it. You can keep that up. Eventually, a breakthrough comes through. It's a little easier to get there. We know a little bit more. We do a two stage sort of thing. So we got a plane with a space shuttle up, and then we just got to launch a space shuttle the rest of the way. Okay, I like that. That's that like is just one of their projected plans, uh, at least for some of the SpaceX stuff I've seen historically. Cool. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, these little things help improve, but if nobody wants to go there and nobody thinks it's worthwhile, it's going to be hard to get the funding. And uh, here's an idea, though. What about cross-training? I was reading up on Brian Blessick, okay, yeah. the actor, the British actor, amazing theatric guy. Yeah, yeah nice beard. Oh, a uh, beard just, just to, to, to <laughs> get down on your knees and admire. It's a magnificent yeah. specimen. Very good. Um, but he's, he's known as a big ham. But I, I love hearing him speak anything. Uh, I remember watching a bit for him, supposed to be uh, nav doing a sat nav uh, voiceover. Oh yeah, it was just um, just I I I don't I put get sat nav just to hear him speak random stuff in the car. I wouldn't pay attention to where you know he says to go. I just love hearing him. <laughs> like don't drive off that cliff. No 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 not that one. Oh no you've gone and done it. Take the next exit. <laughs> It's just great to hear him. He's just such a wonderful ham. It's not what he really is like, but that's his stage persona that gets him a lot of roles. Yep, yep. Now, here's yep. the thing. He's actually gone through the space training stuff. Oh, he yeah. could go to Mars. If you want to spend six months with him, you could do that. Oh, well, Mars is... Oh. It's a six-month trip to get there. I thought it was two years. Uh, oh, wait, maybe... Oh, I suppose it depends when the orbit alignment stuff goes. Yeah, maybe like the fastest possible. I guess. Oh yeah, I don't know. We've gone through that, so yeah, it's it's getting increasingly longer to get there, barring better um, propulsion technology. Okay. So yeah, it'll take a while to get there, but you could do that with him, and I think he'd be a great person to, might, to have might be to go. Thinking on. of the round trip, actually, might oh. be the the two year round trip. I it is always know. nice to have a round trip yeah, planned for that sort of thing, just in case. Uh, but anyways, yeah. But yeah, the, he's he's yeah. fully trained to go there. You can take him to the Mars. You can take him <laughs> to the Moon. You can take him to low Earth orbit. And I think and he'd be a great uh, like celebrity to take up and give the like, speeches and presentations and even a song or two to get people back interested in the amazing stuff. Because there's a lot of good technology that comes out of of working up in microgravity. Well, one of the other things about Brian Blessed is he's one of these adventurer guys, right? He's like, climbed Mount Everest several times. Yeah. He hasn't made it the full way up, but he is mm -hmm. uh, on record for the oldest person to go up Mount Everest, and he's made it highest without oxygen support. So, you know, he's done that. Yeah, he's gone exploring all over the uh, the place. He's a great man to be with. If I'm in a situation whereby there's, like, a chance to panic because we're in a space shuttle and something's gone wrong, the fact that I have this guy who's knowledgeable about hardships and has got just a, such an eloquent voice, I would be very much soothed by him. You wouldn't rather have, like, you know, I don't know, like NASA... I mean... NASA I, I'm can sure basically he's, he's, radio <laughs> off everything. I'm sure he's competent, but I sort of, like, wouldn't you be more confident if you had... NASA's best engineer, or some you know somebody who like. Well, you know, here's the thing. Spent their life doing the whole uh, engineer thing. I like to consider myself a fairly calm person. I know the more you want to panic, the less chance it's actually going to do you any good. 
Yeah. And so I try and embody that whenever, you know, things get stressful. It's like, yeah, don't panic. Just keep on chugging away at it. We can get this done. If you panic, you quit thinking. You quit thinking, more errors crop up. Okay. On the other hand, if I'm in a space shuttle and all of a sudden the oxygen scrubbers are not working, I don't know if I would be able to trust myself to, to remain fully calm. But Brian Blessed <laughs> has done meditation stuff. He taught okay. Keanu Reeves to meditate. Okay. Yeah. Um, he's a man who's got enough char- uh, just, just charisma just, just coming out of every voice and every line he speaks. If he says, calm down, damn it, and <laughs> shake me a little bit, I'm going to calm down. Because of the of, of of how he says it, so he's the com the designated calmer downer. He's the designated morale uh, the official morale. in this whole thing. So but if he says it's time to party, <laughs> by God, I'm gonna party even if I'm tired and I don't have enough oxygen to breathe. But let me ask you this: in this scenario, what what is your job on the the spaceship, the Soyuz capsule? What are you doing? <laughs> What are you bringing to the table? Uh, hopefully I'll be trained enough to know how to fix the stuff myself. Okay, so you're going to be um, an engineer. And but that okay. said, uh, uh, they have done stuff whereby, you know, well, at least in simulation, a person who doesn't know how to fly a plane can successfully have very good odds, fingers crossed, of landing a plane just by being told what to do when. I saw the Mythbusters do that. Yeah. Yes, and so actually being told how to do that really does help your chances. So even though the delay might be a little longer than I would care for for sending a message through radio into space, yeah. I think I can trust the engineers to come up with a solution to whatever problems crop up. And if there's not, then it just couldn't be done. So you got put on the spaceship sort of by accident then? I'm the equivalent of the... <laughs> You're the, the janitor who fell in and then the door locked and it launched? <laughs> Um, I consider myself the next generation of space monkey, honestly. And somehow Brian Blessed was also there with you. Um, perhaps my biology background helps me out. We're going to Mars. They're going to need uh, someone to work with the plants. I really come in handy once we've hit ground. Although, I guess, like, space janitor. Well, space is a better area for it. space, I mean, almost any... Any job basically is like a hundred, a million times awesomer if you add space. Like space janitor, I mean, how many? Like you need a degree to be a space janitor. Yeah, you need to know how to do like because it's not just a standard like oh yeah, mop up here or you you run a rag over that. You'd have you'd have like one of those like air picks like uh, what you have at the dentist. You know, sucking lightly the dust off of everything to make sure it's you know you know properly cleansed. It's not just something you can okay just yeah I'm done. There we go. So this is a topic that you wanted to bring up anyways. It's a nice backup topic, but how uh, space enhances all things. Uh, It makes the jobs cooler. It makes the monsters more fearsome. Zombies? You can walk away from a lot of zombies. They shamble. I mean, that's like a zombie horde. You can just make sure you you turn the corner and, you know, walk down the street, turn another corner. If they haven't turned that first corner by the time you're gone, they can't follow you. They don't know which way you went. Um, unless they've got one of those I can sense the living sort of things, but whatever. Yeah. A lot of zombies, though, aren't very quick historically. Well, they shouldn't be able to s- sense the living because their their own sense should overpower. Well, I, I imagine this would be some sort of supernatural okay. thing. Like, uh, I prefer to live in, in, in a zombie apocalypse where they're coming back because hell is full. And so, you know, the sinners come back and inhabit their rotting flesh and they only crave the flesh of the living sort of thing. I don't need a real deep explanation. Yeah, okay. It's a zombie apocalypse, whatever. Okay. Um, in space, it doesn't matter how slow they are, there's very little room for you to run away from. <laughs> yeah, you can run to the, the... The International Space Station is like, what, the size of a football field? <laughs> uh, and most of it's <laughs> taken up by electronics compartments. You don't actually move from A to B. It's not like you've got a, a full field to maneuver around. I guess, in. yeah, like there's a lot of it is just solar panels. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so... There you go. You're in a yeah. zombie space apocalypse. Well, doesn't that make for a rather short movie? <laughs> no, because oh. done right, it makes for a much more intense movie. Yeah. Because you only have so many areas to go for. It's not like, oh, and then we ran away to the mall. It's like, and then the zombies managed to make their way plus this through this area. We closed off the hatch. And now we're down one on less room. The slow beating of the zombie fist against the door is only one way for them to get in. You can see them as they climb around on the outside. Because you know what? Zombies don't breathe. So technically, they do better in space than you and I do. Well, Zombies okay. become much more fearful that way. You know what? Don't Vampires don't. They're, mean, they're sort of, their blood would freeze and like basically make them immobile. Uh, given that nobody ever seems to care about what happens after the first winter in a zombie apocalypse, I assume blood really doesn't give a damn for zombies. 
they leak it out in a span of whatever through uh, through their dying parts. So and I guess in space, it's like what does it boil off or something like that? Uh, because of the lack of pressure, it just kind of like just hiss out a, a, in a gas as it tries to equalize pressure gradients. Cool. Um, they might become blind with a lack of eyeballs, but that just makes them look scarier. <laughs> There's a bunch of blind zombies crawling around trying to find any which way in. But if if a zombie gets knocked off the space station, he's not getting back on the space station. No, which is weird. One saving grace. That'd be the equivalent to having like a gun. Yeah. Because if you're gonna knock them off, and provided they're not tethered, they're gone. They're, uh, yeah, they're not coming back. It would be kind of nice to see a zombie just you know go back down into you know orbit you know and, and uh, just coming in there just heating up. Boom. <laughs> Although if a zombie has, um, depending on how the, the mechanics of it work. But maybe the the gases that are escaping from the rotting flesh, maybe they don't escape. Like maybe they have like an organ or something where the gases haven't escaped yet. So they could have a orient themselves. System. Yeah, yeah, just naturally the right way, and all of a sudden uh, the front, uh, you know, like area, you know, where all the main organs just burst out, and all of a sudden their organs go out one way. They go back to the space yeah, station, and then they got no organs, but they're still hungry. Yeah. yeah. So, or you could have it be that. Uh, like, uh, the intestine gets wrapped around some piece, so that becomes their tether. <laughs> See, there's a lot you could do, and they become much scarier because of the limited space and the, the Funnier natural too, confinement. but scarier, yes. Funny and scary. And let's face it, some of the best scenes on, on a good horror movie tend to be humorous, but they just play them so incredibly straight. Yeah. Uh, so long as nobody's laughing over it, the audience can laugh like, oh my god, the intestine became a tether for them. Hilarious! Well, and... Earlier, we talked a little bit about whether monsters are actually necessary, because, I mean, space is a very scary place to I hear that gravity movie is very yeah. suspenseful. Yeah, I was going to bring that up, too. It, so, it's very scary uh, to be in not space. Not wholly scientifically accurate. Neil deGrasse Tyson said, although he enjoyed it, the uh, the stuff going on there was very wrong for some mm-hmm. aspects. But whatever. I don't good, care. good story is a good story. If he's able to forgive it, and I don't know the difference... Sure. He's forgiven worse movies in the past. Yeah. <laughs> Plus, I mean, you know, let's face it, there's George Clooney and Sandra Bullock in there, so they're good actors. I'll give them a little extra leeway when it comes to, you know, bad script. They can make it work. I, well, I don't know. I don't. E- I haven't seen it. So Neither have I, but I'm willing to grant them, just based on who they are. I'll, they've got credit in my book. I'll, okay. I'll give them yeah. a little I've enjoyed bad. stuff they've done in the past. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, so are zombies, like, necessary, or, or is it just, you know, for the fun factor, basically? It'd be part for the fun factor, as well as to, because, let's face it, a good setting for horror involves isolation. Yeah. Zombies work in a mass scale, because all of a sudden, it doesn't matter you're in a city, you're isolated into this area, or you have to try and make runs from A to B, it's not generally safe, you're not open. Uh, werewolf tracking you down in the woods, you might be able to find a cabin and lock yourself in, but you can't just walk through the woods and be all right. Very confined, very isolated. Mm-hmm. A key theme of horror. Yeah. Space station is much more isolated than almost <laughs> anywhere else on Earth. Yeah. Um, maybe with the exception of like an oil rig. Zombies on an oil rig. Fun way to go. Um, they, oh, yeah. There we go. Yeah. Instead of pumping up oil, they, they hit Satan's blood. Ooh, cool. Yeah, uh, the Satan's blood is on me. Now I'm a zombie. There you go. There's your plot. Uh, I'm sure there's like an abandoned oil rig or something you could uh, pick up for a decent uh, licensing price. Make your own movie. Have fun with that. Yeah. Well, there's Sea Land. And oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Of Land and there's a lot of... Uh, so, oh, I know there's a couple of decommissioned ones you could probably get for a decent you know, price to use for six weeks of shooting during good weather. <laughs> yeah, you can make it work. Well, I think they use them for... Haven't they done a scene in James Bond on one of those? Uh, likely. One of, one of the movies. Oh, I don't remember. Anyways. Uh, well, they've done some stuff uh, on, on C, and just because that works well. It's a very yeah. nice, isolated thing. How can James Bond escape? He can't just you know, parachute out. It's water. He's got to find another way out. He's got to get like a jet boat to escape in. So, yeah, this yeah. the space station really does heighten the isolationism. So you could yeah. have a vampire up there. Oh, yeah. Yeah, because he wants your blood, and it's the only <laughs> blood, you know, orbiting around space. I mean, but what happened? Well, I guess it, the movie's over when he drinks all eight. Like, say there's eight astronauts. Ah, but here's the there. thing. It, it, it yeah. can work on a different thing, because with vampires, it's like, oh, they can only attack you at night. So there's like a so maybe an eight-hour eight eight period. Minutes, That's the thing. When you're orbiting, a full day is 90 minutes long, so the whole cycle works differently. 
So you could really change up vampires without necessarily changing anything about them. You don't need them to sparkle. You don't need them um, to, to twinkle and, and be all right and, and, and wonderful human beings. You can still have them be monsters. You can still have them avoid the sun. And let's face it, the sun without the solar radiation shielding up the atmosphere, I'm willing to bet that'll really hurt a vampire. Actually, that's... That'll that's, probably blow him away in an instant. No, just, ah, sort of thing. He just looks back, boom, dust. Blown away in the stellar cosmos. I believe that will... I, I can't remember that damages people. Like, well, you can't look at the sun. Like, if you're in space, it's you, the purest sun you'll ever experience. <laughs> yeah, I think it'll break your eyes, but it might even burn. Like, well, I don't know if it burns. It might be cause radiation burns. I, yeah, I'll, it's yeah. very, very potent compared to you know yeah. down here on Earth. But yeah, that would take care of a vampire pretty good. So he'd have to definitely make certain. Maybe you could have the one situation whereby he's a. Uh, he, you know, he, he hides on the far side of the space station on the outside, and uh, as it rotates, he has to keep maneuvering himself to keep <laughs> in the shadow. So yeah. even he's playing a game. It's like he's hunting the uh, the astronauts in there, but you know what? The sun is hunting him, so it's like a hunter hunted hunted error sort mm -hmm. of thing. Yeah, <laughs> oh, no. Oh, that'd be cool. It's a nice way of playing things. It's a, a nice uh, little cinematic thing of, of uh, you know seeing him just maneuver himself to keep in the shadow on there. He's a smart uh, villain. It's a nice way of showing you you have a smart villain. He has tactics, even if it's yeah. just you keep on the dark side of the spacecraft. Well, I mean, I would think, like, uh, spacesuits are designed to protect the astronauts from the, the sun. Solar radiation, radiation yeah, the lack of atmosphere, all sorts of problems. visor that they can pull down for those. I think they... I'm not sure if they only do... Yeah, I think they're out there during the day. During well, the 90 minutes, and if it takes you two hours to fix something, you're out there yeah, all day and night. Yeah, because sometimes they do walks that are hours long because they have a lot of work to do. So, yeah, sure. Yeah. Um, so, so they have to be protected against that, uh, the sunlight. Also, so if a vampire got a hold of the suit, but maybe he can't, maybe the suit's in a different module to begin with, you know. Maybe so it was like an, you know, like an escape of opportunity. They, they had um, dehydrated garlic. Oh, nice. <laughs> they, they, they throw that at him, and he ah, you know, opens up the space uh, hatch, and I'll show you. And all of a sudden, it, they, the, the garlic washes off into space. They're trying to stay alive. He just, you know, leaves out there, closes the door behind him. He'll be back later on. Yeah. They have to sleep sometime. Da -da -da -da. But he, meanwhile, yeah, he needs to stay away from the sun and maybe find a space suit or something. That he needs to get himself back in, you know. Thing. He, he, didn't, he doesn't want to kill his food because, you know, he just gets rid of the garlic and, you know, closes the door before anyone gets sucked out. That's his food in there, man. Can you imagine, like, the um, the astronaut, the living astronaut, they're like, um, they think they're safe and they're like, they're backing into the the room with the, um, the spacesuits in them. And they think, okay, you know, I think he's outside. And it's like, you know... He turns around and, like, inside the spacesuit is the, the vampire. Ah, scary. For, yeah. See, this is good stuff. I mean, with a decent budget, you could really make this work. Sure, yeah. So so the point is, anything is better in space. Uh, everything's a little better in space, at least. Yeah. Uh, the monsters are a bit better. I mean, it turns zombie from, like, like, you need a horde of zombies usually to work this one. You can have two, three zombies, and then they become really nasty in space. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I don't, I don't necessarily know how something like Frankenstein's monster would work. Uh, perhaps... Astronaut goes up into space, turns out he has lycanthropy. The moon is always full. And so it becomes like a 90 minute orbit, like on which side do, can you see the moon? Like 45 minutes he's a normal person, 45 minutes he wants to rip you to shreds. Because the moon is out there and it's all, it's like super full. Maybe he becomes like a mega <laughs> werewolf, man. Well, no one's seen a moon as big and as full as he has, so he, he just toes like super nuts. The moon I don't know. wouldn't always be full from orbit. Um, if you were orbiting the moon at a, at a, at a what a moon lunar synchronous orbit, lunar synchronous, but it, the, the moon is like so much more there. It is, you know, yeah. I suppose you don't have like a, yeah, you don't have atmospheric, you know, like um, whatever it is that that dilutes it. And I guess I mean there's the question of like what about the moon? Well, see, is it that here's, actually affects where here's the thing. Um, if you're not going with the, the historical Larry Talbot, it's all in your mind sort of thing. Yeah. Uh, it does seem to be the moonlight that hits you. Yeah, that that's it. That's been it comes out lately. from the, the shadows. The ah, he gets it, and then he transforms. So it could be you know what? There's no atmosphere. You get hit by proper full moonlight. Bam. Super werewolf. Super werewolf. Yeah. 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 
And werewolves do tend to, to heal their injuries faster in most movies. So this way he could, like, uh, lose an arm, you know, like, as he's closing the hatch, and it grows back. Explanation? Super werewolf. He's out in space. Whatever. Now, I think the same deal would apply to the moon, though, with the 90-minute cycle, though. You yeah, see, that's you the thing. You see the moon for every 45 Yeah, 45 minutes. minutes, he's back to a regular person, <laughs> and that's when he becomes the hunted. Then... After that period, moonlight comes in through you know the, the capsule filters and all that if they can't block it off well enough, and bam, he becomes werewolf. Now he's the hunter once again. So you have a nice back and forth going on. Right. But we got to make sure that the, the werewolf and the vampire interact, otherwise people will say the movie's no good. It could have just been two separate movies. Why did they try putting them together if they didn't interact? And you know, actually, a dual pronged attack where where you know it's like a, the werewolf you know working on the one end and the vampire working on the other that gets really scary. Because <laughs> I mean. Freddy versus Jason was pretty darn good when, uh, you know, Freddy had, you know, and Jason do some of the work to help heighten the scares for him, to get mm -hmm. the fear he needed to properly manifest. That he was using, the one was using the other there, and so that was worked out nice, even if the interaction started out very minimal. So, as long as one's using it, the, they're actually there yeah. together. I'm okay with that. Yeah. I was the Frankenstein was yeah. really just like, you could have had three different movies working with one central, you know, a mad scientist protagonist. He was like the center, and they were all spokes. Mm. They just really didn't interact at all. So, you know, yes, you do have to make sure if you're having different villains that they got to work, you know, at least as though they were in the same spot, not just like cut and paste separate. I guess so. I mean, you you don't again, you don't buy the whole like this is a series of short stories. Uh, or do you think maybe well, think they it was it the, uh, I was able to see the uh, the advertisements they were doing for it in the theaters, uh -huh. and they said you know it's uh, they had you know like four times the monsters because they included mad scientists as one. <laughs> it's a trope, whatever. Yeah. So you know they you know they had four, you know four times this, four times the horror. But you know what? They only ever act interacted with the, through the main mad scientist. Yeah. Well, if they don't interact, then that that actually is correct arithmetic because four. Mon four monsters like one plus one plus one plus one equals four. Whereas if they were working together, then it'd be the whole s more than the sum of the ah, parts. Yeah. But no, it like was like this: four times. times the monsters should be four times the horror, not horror, 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 horror done separately. Mm -hmm. So in this okay. way, if you're gonna have four times the horror, it's got to be one full number. All four of them got to be together. Well, if you say so. Or heck, if they could at least yeah. pair them off two versus two, you know. Ooh, that'd be fun. Yeah, I could really dig that. Tank, tank team match. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you, you could work with the uh, the intelligence of Dracula, but he's confined based on time. So he's got, like, uh, the Frankenstein's monster to be his guardian and yeah. brute force. Frankenstein, fully powered, has got a lot of muscle. But on the other hand, the wolfman's got the enhanced senses and abilities of a wolf. He can maybe outmaneuver him, but he can't outthink the Dracula. So, what happens? He gets the mad scientist to help him. Then it's a battle of bronze, you know, and a battle of brains at the same time. I could really go for that sort of thing. That would have made for a really excellent movie, because then you could say, oh, I'm rooting for this monster. <laughs> on the other hand, this side's cool, too. So, you know, in this scene, I'll root for them. On this one, I'll go back to this one. Play it however you want. Stick by your favorite monster throughout the entire film. Watch it again. Well, stick with another one. It's like two different movies. You're rooting for the other team. Very good. So we're running out of time. All right. I just want to remind our listeners, we have email, thesimulationist at gmail.com. We have a YouTube channel that it's all the same stuff, so you might actually... Put up a comment. Oh, stuff. if you're okay with the whole <laughs> Google Plus thing. A bit oh. of a contentious bone right now. I'm sure they'll fi figure out something that makes at least half the people happy. I think, yeah, that's what a lot of people are saying, is that it's horrible right now, but... Well, it's not fully that. working as intended, yeah. but... Don't let that stop you. Try and put a line down if you yeah. you, you mark something as like oh at this point and you know I want to insert a comment. Still, the best way to do that is through uh, our uh, YouTube page. It's yes, we are, we're watching it and we'll try and hopefully you can comment and um, you know if if you can't comment there there are iTunes reviews there are our blog post has a little place that you can put comments um, the simulation simulationist .com. Has a little spot. Like, if um, you're the grandchild of the person who wrote the script to House of Frankenstein, and you think I, I gave it an unharshly uh, unfair review, I'm willing to talk this out. Or, in fact, if you're anybody and you thought you had a, a differing opinion or we forgot to mention something, uh, that's cool, too. I, maybe there was a bit I wasn't really seeing about the whole thing, you know? Uh, 
that? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, also, Facebook has some um, places that you can comment on this episode. Um, we often put our own little uh, comments too after the fact on the Facebook page. So if you're listening and you have access to Facebook, you can. It's a prime way of going in on there. Slash the simulationist. Um, and I think, I mean, there, there's all kinds of other places. Um, Basically, Google us, around. Bing us, uh, use the Yahoo search bar, or whatever. You yeah. can find us that way oh, through the simulation. I'm on Twitter at spaceboot one, uh, at spaceboot numeral one. Spaceboot I'm one. reading Twitter, but I'm not actually a member thereof at this point. Okay, well, we'll have to get you signed up or something. I don't know, I don't know if I'm okay with a 140 character limit. <laughs> Sometimes I'm a little loquacious. Well, just do, do a second tweet. That's that's what I don't get about Twitter. People are like complaining about the the limit, but just do another tweet. <laughs> but then I got to figure out where to properly divide it, and then it add 144 characters. <laughs> uh, then I might split halfway through. I want to yeah. make sure I get this right. If I'm going to craft something the world can see, I want to make sure it's presentable. That's okay, the kind well, of guy I yeah, am. Okay. Yeah. Fair enough. I, I, if, I, if I can't convince you to go on Twitter, I guess I won't. I am considering going on at some point, but I got my plate full right now. I'm a busy guy, and I'm doing a lot of coding, so... Ah, that's good. Yeah, working hard on, on more simulations. Very Fun cool. fiction and testing out a game. I always love testing the limits. Uh, so do you want to, do you have any final thoughts? Uh, wrapping up on... Sorry for all the spoilers <laughs> if I ruined like a whole lot of stuff for you guys. <laughs> yeah. I do say statute of limitations on some stuff and other stuff just wasn't worth it. Uh, well, apology accepted. There, but I did give a lot of potential promises for plot lines for movies if someone wants to take it up and write a script. That's going out for free. So I think ultimately you can at least consider this to be, uh, uh, neutral. I'd say so. I gave you some spoilers, but I gave you some movie ideas. There you go. Okay. Well, there. There we have it. There's another iteration in the... In the can. can. Uh, I was going to try and think of another word, but yeah, can. On the line? In the the digital spacey space. (laughs) That works. Uh, Yeah. Okay, so I've been Josh Trelevin. I've been Ryan Kirkby. All right. Thanks for listening. Send us money.